Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Welcome to Sports Spectrum. I am Jason Romano. It is great to have you joining us here on the program today. we got a great conversation with Patrick Estep. He is the men's basketball coach at Cedarville University. They're NCAA Division II, and they're also a part of the NCCAA, the National Christian College Athletic Association. They happen to be the NCCAA National Champions last year, and Patrick Estep was the National Coach of the Year in the NCCAA. Before we get to our conversation with Coach Estep, though, I want to tell you about Compassion International. They are the most trusted child development ministry in the world. They release children from poverty. They provide hope to children in need, and they make it so easy because you and I can just sign up simply going to their website, and for $38 a month, tax deductible, of course, you can release a child from poverty. That's how cool this opportunity is. So check out the website, compassion.com slash sports spectrum. You'll see a list of children there. They're waiting to be released from poverty. Age ranges from two to three years old to 16, 17 years old. Children all across the world. And you can sponsor that child and make a difference in their life. $38 a month. Check out the website, compassion.com slash sports spectrum. Pray about it and consider sponsoring a child today. Patrick Estep, as I mentioned, the 2019 NCCAA National Coach of the Year and part of the NCCAA National Championship team from 2019. Patrick is a lifer, as they say in many ways. He's been with Cedarville a long time, 20 plus years. He's actually a 1997 graduate of Cedarville College. And this is his first and only head coaching position that he's held. He was named the Cedarville men's basketball coach back in July of 2008, now entering year 12 here in the 2019-2020 season. I know you'll enjoy getting to know Patrick Estep and what it's like to coach as a Christian at a Christian college in the NCAA Division II and NCCAA ranks. Check it out. Patrick Estep here on Sports Spectrum's podcast. Take a listen. Coach Estep, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you, Jason. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. And you're coming off of a season where you won the NCCAA National Championship, National, uh, let me get this right, National Christian College Athletic Association. And you're also a part of the NCAA in Division II. And we'll kind of talk about that and kind of what the differences are in a second. But you were Coach of the Year as well, your team obviously winning a title. So, Let's start there. You're getting ready for the 2019-2020 season. How do you kind of move forward and try to go back at it when you reach the mountaintop, as they say, when you win a championship in the in the past year? Yeah, I think one privilege for us in being a part of both divisions um, and, and working at a Christian college where we can play in the NCCAA um, – it, it was a tremendous experience. We had a really young team last year. We had, I think, um, out of our four freshmen and a sophomore, those guys averaged about 50 points a game for us. Um, actually, maybe a hair more towards the end of the year. So we knew we had a lot coming back, and it was going to be a great experience. Um, and not to downplay the NCCA because we've it's not easy to win. It's been a really good tournament. But in some way, that is almost like for us – being an NIT tournament, it's a secondary tournament, which our primary goal was to get in the NCAA Division II tournament. Sure. We got in the second round. So I think as far as motivation, getting ready for next year, um, well, which is this season, um, that wasn't hard for our guys. They they loved being a part of that national championship. And I told them, you know, just the experience of winning your last game doesn't happen very often. So just experiencing that learning how to compete in a tournament setting was really big but their ultimate goal was going is going to be to get to the division two national tournament and um see what we can do there yeah. so they were pretty motivated this off season we've had a really good fall and it's been a it's been a lot of fun but that was a tremendous experience it was really a lot of fun for our guys so. i know as we're taping this in sort of mid to late october the season hasn't started yet um and you just kind of came off a retreat with your team. Can you share a little bit about 
the idea of going on a retreat right before the season and kind of your goals and I guess the intentions of doing a retreat like that? Yeah, we have done this for, I was an assistant here for eight years and I think we started this about our second or third year here. Um, so we've probably been doing this retreat for eight, 17 or 18 years. Um, and we go down to a church camp that is near my hometown. Um, Scioto Hills church camp is where we go every year. Um, my parents and some family you know, cook dinner, and it's it's a time where we no cell phones. We take the cell phones from them. Uh, they leave them in their lockers, and then we get on the road. And it's really been a great experience for our guys. It's one of those things when we have postseason meetings, it's the one thing that every guy to a T for the last 17 years has said, don't quit doing that um, because mm-hmm. it's a – it's a great bonding experience, you know, and it's been different things in different years. When we were in AI, we would uh, maybe be finishing up conditioning when we went on this retreat. And and when we went NCAA Division II, we started going over a fall break, which has typically been the start of practice. So, you know, we're, we're going down there and practicing in my old high school or something like that um, when we can. But we do um, – the way it starts, we, we take off from here. Uh, we get down there. Um, and we, usually we would eat at some local place. I don't, I'm one of those guys, I'm kind of a foodie, but I'm, I like, I don't want to <laughs> eat at a chain if I can help it. So, I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, like, so there's this greasy dive hamburger joint. We've taken them to every year that, um, that they enjoy. And then my parents always cook a home cooked meal for them, which the guys, that's kind of a highlight for them. They get to hang out at their house. And, um, so that's what we did this year. The first night we, my parents cooked. The next morning, we always get up and we do some work at the camp. Um, so we try and help them for about three hours, just do some things that maybe 18 guys can do faster than one or two guys could do. Um, so this year, we we're stacking wood, chopping wood, um, cleaning out some buildings for them. So just serving the camp. And then um, we normally do a, a ropes course. So we did a Goliath swing type thing this year that um, – to a, to a few of our guys had to really overcome some serious fears to do, but it was kind of cool to watch them do that. And um, and then we headed home and practiced at a high school. We shortened it by a day this year because of our exhibition games, but it's been a great experience. Um, we get them in. We have we do some prayer walks at night. We write thank you notes to people who have had spiritual impact on our life. Um, mm-hmm. And each player does that, and they can write two or three if they want. Um, just somebody who's had a, a real influence on them spiritually. Um, they do that. And then we kind of start, uh, or this year we started our team devotional times earlier, but um, kind of the, those themes throughout the year that we want to characterize who we are, we'll, we'll plug into those a little bit as well. Cedarville is, is kind of all you've known, which I think is fascinating yeah. that you've been there. You were a graduate from there. You've coached there, been the head coach since 08. It's such a unique place that God has put you in coach because you get to you get to coach these guys in the game of basketball but you also get to bring that faith element in intentionally and have no reservations and I remember talking to Greg Tonegal at Indiana Wesleyan about this same exact thing and their motto being I am third and we talked to a lot of other coaches in fact we just had Nate Oates on from Alabama a couple weeks ago on the podcast and that's a public institution and it's not a Christian institution. So you have to kind of, I don't know, watch how you live out that, not how you live out that faith, but how you, you know, bring that faith, I guess, into the locker room. You don't yeah. really have to worry about that, I guess. You have to be careful about each person that you're, you're discipling and working with in their, in their spiritual, you know, journeys. But how is that for you? I mean, because you, you're in Division Two, NCAA Division Two, so you're coaching against a lot of schools and a lot of coaches that may not be believers. How is that dynamic for you, knowing that every day you can, you're kind of in ministry in a lot of ways? Yeah, you're, you're right. And it is a dyna- dynamic that Greg and I both and some other coaches at our levels have the opportunity to live out. That's a lot of fun. Um, you, there's not, there are challenges, um, but they're different challenges than if I was trying to, you know, be at a state school and maybe say, hey, these are principles that are they're going to help you, you know, live a life that's going to be without a lot of trouble. I get to talk about those principles and say, hey, these are principles where you get to live a life that honors God. And, yeah. you know, we can uh, we approach it that way. Uh, Greg is tremendous. He, he's really good at that stuff. We've done a retreat the last couple of years where we have actually went up there and 
kind of met with them and with some other coaches that are coaching at Christian colleges to see how they disciple guys and what they do. And we've learned a lot from them. Um, but you're right. It's a different, I mean, when we were in AI, there's a lot of, uh, Christian colleges or at least religious colleges in the NAIA. And yeah. when we went division two, there's a lot more state schools. Um, so it's something we don't, you know, we are who we are. We don't back away from that at Cedarville. We're thankful that God's put us in, um, this platform. And it's one of the things when we went division two that I said, I just felt like as an athletic department, the, the ministry opportunities are much greater because, there's not a lot of schools in division two, like there were in NAI where you have, you know, some faith component to what you're doing. Um, so we have an outreach opportunity here where we, we talk to our guys a lot. We want to compete. Um, we, we always say that, you know, if you have a mission where you're trying to honor God and what you're doing, um, and, and unless you're really successful at it, most of the people aren't going to care. Um, so yeah. We want, we want to do well. We want to be excellent in how we're doing those things, but we also want to make sure that I think for me as a coach, being at Cedarville, I have the opportunity to talk about why all of these things matter about, you know, our core values of being selfless, persevering, having unity, living with integrity. Like I can talk about why those things matter to God and matter in your spiritual life and your journey versus just being a good person. And, um, you know, that's, that's the thing I've enjoyed. And like you said, I don't really know any different at this point after graduating from here and being here 20 years. So. What is the challenge though, in that you said there are challenges to this, yeah. you know, sort of living. Cause I, I can tell you my challenges are my ministry sports spectrum, even working in my church can become my God and take the place of my personal relationship for you. What are some of the challenges of being a, a, a Christian coach in a Christian organization like Cedarville? Well, I think one of the challenges as the coach and also for our players is you want to be able to be real with guys. And sometimes that doesn't always feel safe to be real with your players or have them be real with you in a Christian environment. We can tend to build these boxes of, you know, these walls up where it's like, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. And it's like, there's no, you know, we don't want to fail on purpose, but there, there can be sometimes not room to fail and yeah. growth that and disciple guys through that. And we try to make sure that's not who we are. I don't think that's what Cedarville's, you know, our president doesn't want to be about that. He wants this to be a place where there's grace and there's, you know, there's forgiveness and things like that. But so I think that's one challenge. Another challenge is just um, getting guys to, to, I, it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not. Most of us grow up, you know, we want to compete and do our best for ourselves. And we try and flip that switch when they get here and make them think that like, Hey, God cares about how well, how hard you do and how hard you go and practice, how well you prepare, how, you know, it's not just chapel and church that he cares about. It's everything. And so when you walk through those doors, like this is an act of worship. And I think for a lot of our guys, even though they come from great homes and Christian families and that's still maybe the first time they've ever really thought about the game of basketball being that. And, and, you know, cause to me, if it's not, then why, why does practice really matter? You know, other than I'm trying to be good for myself, you know? So I think we talk about games and practice and all those things that God gives us an opportunity to go out and take gifts he's given us and give them back to him with everything we got. And that's how we approach it. Um, so those are the challenges where you're trying to get, you're trying to do two things when you're, you're going to disciple guys and you want to give them a safe space to come to you. You know, if, if they made a mistake or they messed up or they want some help with something. Um, and then you also, that other avenue of saying, Hey, God cares about all this stuff and yeah. it's drive us to do our very best all the time. Um, and not just for ourselves. So Patrick Estep is our guest here on Sports Spectrum from Cedarville University, university men's basketball coach. Um, every team sort of has a motto or core values or principles. You can use whatever word you want to put on them. What's your guys' motto? What's your core principles? What's what's core values? Whatever it is that you have getting ready for the 2019-2020 season, what are those? Yeah, I think our motto can change throughout the years depending on what we think those teams need. And, um, 
Um, and sometimes those evolve, you know, as you see what your team needs. But the last couple of years, we've had one where we talk about um, fearing one. And on the back of our practice jerseys is First Samuel, I think it's 12, 24, where, it, you know, um, we're talking about only fear the Lord. And there's so much of a fear of man in all of our lives, whether you're a coach or a player. Um, and we're trying to push back against that. And we try and put that out in front of our guys, you know, it's the write it on our hearts. We write it on our back. And yeah, yeah, I think that is just a concept where that, that may be our motto. We, we don't want to fear anything but God. And we want to make sure we have a healthy fear of God. Um, because I don't think, um, no fear is a biblical concept. You know, I, I don't think we, we do need to have a healthy fear of God and that's good. And so we, we want to approach it that way. We also have the phrase better together, um, I, I don't think Christians and ourselves have enough unity. You know, it doesn't mean you don't stand for truth and those things, but at the same time, um, unity, if you look through the New Testament, was something that that's how people knew you were believers. And we've gotten away from that a little bit. So I think the the best thing about basketball and any team sport is the ability to you have to have everybody else and you have to realize, hey, we are better together. And that avenue to do that on a court and later let that play out in life is big. Um, our core values have been kind of the, sta- the same. Um, we want we want to have self. When you watch us play, you should see this. We want to be selfless. We want to be have guys that serve each other, um, and that should show up even in how we play the game. Um, so we're really big on assists and things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want to have perseverance. I, I think our probably from my generation down where we haven't went through really hard times like my grandparents did in the depression and the world wars. Um, we don't have a society that perseveres very well. And we're trying to ingrain that in our guys where, Hey man, I I want you to come out of here and we want you to persevere in your marriage, in your job, in, in your church. We don't want you to walk away when the first sign of things getting tough happens. And, you know, my, my theory is in basketball, we can take this game where at the end of the day, it's a win or a loss. So what? You know, we can take this game and learn these lessons of being selfless, having perseverance, having unity, and having a, an integrity about yourself on and off the court where it's, it's with a, it, you know, it's not your family. It's not your kids. It's not your wife. It's not your job. That's at stake. It's a game. And I'm hoping we're, we're driving those things home as we're playing the game so that when they get out of here and I can look back 10 years from now that these guys have healthy marriages, they're, they're great at work. They're really an integral part of their church, you know, those kind of things in their society, they're making a difference. Like those are the things that matter. I love that. That's great stuff there from Patrick E. Steph. Coach, share share with us your testimony. We ask a lot of people on these podcasts for their testimonies. And I think as coaches, you know, you're pouring into so many others, you might not get a chance to tell everybody about your walk with the Lord and kind of where it started and took shape. So share that with us. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I grew up in a Christian home and uh, my parents that loved God and grandparents that were as steady as I can even, I don't know anyone else that there's one word that describes them as that. And um, so we grew up in a church, um, maybe a little more formal church until I was about 13, where um, I think I think I was 13 and I um I had heard, I remember being eight years old when my mom said something about to me. Um, one of my friends had kind of given their heart to Christ. And my mom said something. It was the first time I actually felt a little conviction, like, hey, I need to do that. I am a sinner. And, um, but I didn't right away. And uh, we changed churches shortly after this. But when I was 13, we went to a, a Christian, I, I've always called it a Christian Woodstock because that's essentially what it was at Asbury <laughs> College. Yep. Uh, and uh, it's called Ichthus. And um, it was, you know, there's probably 50,000 people out in the field. And it, I, it was huge. And um, I remember the last night hearing a, a comedian actually speak after one of the concerts and shared the gospel. And I'm laying out there in a blanket. And I'm like, I, this is now between me and God. I can't rely on my parents' faith. And so at 13, I asked Christ in my heart. And, um, you know, I, I failed like a lot of teenagers did. And so many times growing up, just thinking that my relationship with Christ was so dependent on what I did and, um, 
I think, you know, I mean, you're at the altar a lot. You're trying to be like, man, what's I'm not, I'm just keep making mistakes or whatever. Um, but when I went to college, I went to university of Kentucky for a year and loved it, got involved with, um, campus crusade there, but really missed playing basketball. And God used that to get me to come to Cedarville and I played JV here. And, um, <clears throat> but when I got to Cedarville, that's, that's when I felt like my faith really started to become my own and something that I was, um, you know, God's ultimately responsible for it, but I had to put some work into and how, how to go about that. And it got discipled by some guys here that were my friends, um, who were probably further down the road than I was. And that was really tremendous, um, for me, my time here, going to chapel every day, doing those things that Cedarville just kind of pours into you, um, was really good. And then, you know, as it grow and you get married and you have kids, um, you, the marriage is, I told my guys this all the time, marriage is the quickest way to find out how selfish you are. <laughs> that is so <laughs> true. <laughs> not the hard way, probably for a while. But oh, yeah. God has been gracious. We've had some, my wife is tremendous. Um, she's a very godly woman and pours into me as well as our kids. And those are the, God has always surrounded me with people um, who've invested in me. And that, that has been a really beneficial um, thing about being in an environment like Cedarville. What are some of the sort of disciplines that you've developed over the years? And maybe as you look back early in your walk and in college and arriving at Cedarville, you know, it's been 20 years or so. And you look back and you're like, all right, these are the things that I wish I had done when I was younger than I'm doing now. What are some of those? Honestly, I think it's being in God's word. I, I, I am a... I'm not a type A personality. I don't wake up with a to-do list to do every day. That's just, those things wear me out and stress me out. And it's not who I've ever been. I've tried it, but they last about a month. Um, so for me, I've always been a feel guy and, and trying to relate to people that way. And I love being around, I get recharged by people. Um, but the one thing I wish I would have done earlier, more consistently was being God's word. And I feel like even over the last three years, that has been, my wife got me into um, uh, Bible, uh, shoot, uh, BSF, Bible Study Fellowship. Okay. It is. Um, and I did that a couple of years with some men, which was very beneficial. But the consistent habit of just being in God's Word daily and the times in your life where things are going well, but also the times in your life when there's struggles and the more you're in it, the more you see God's word come alive. Like, and I've always heard that phrase, but some of the times there are the last few years where I've had some struggles um, for different with different things and different things going on at work or whatever. Like, just seeing God's word like almost hit me across the face is has really been cool. So that's probably the biggest one. I'd love. I want to be more of a person of prayer. I don't think that's the, my strength right now that I need to do a better job of, but being in God's word, being disciplined, trying to get in it in the morning, um, if I can, has been really the, the greatest influence in my life. I wish I would have been more consistent with earlier. You came to be the head coach in 2008. So talk to the 2008 Patrick E. Step when you first took this job as a head coach at Cedarville. Obviously, you've been there before then, uh, having been there for a long time. But becoming a head coach is a different a different animal. Yeah. So what would you say to your, I don't know, 12 years ago self about this job and this sort of role and even this ministry that you're a part of with Cedarville? Well, one thing to it before I forget, I, I had a tremendous boss for eight years. He was a really godly man. Ray Slagle was his name. And hmm. I learned a ton from him. Um, and he prepared me well. At the time, I might have been a little uh, frustrated at, towards the end where I feel like, man, I'm doing more and more. And then looking back, I'm realizing he was giving me more and more to get me ready to be the head coach. But um, I go back to that guy a lot, honestly. And I've, I've apologized to those players <laughs> because I was a jerk. You know, I think you look back and you're trying to no matter how much you fight it, when you slide up those 18 inches into that next seat, you still try to prove yourself. Sure. And you take that out on your guys. And we had a really good team. We started the year, I think, 22 and one. We were the number one team in the country in NAI. We had the best defense in the country. You know, and you can get, I got a little puffed up, probably thinking, man, I know what I'm doing. I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> and yeah. um, I, I coached those guys too hard. And I really wish 
I think I'm doing a better job now of relating to, I still stay in touch with those guys and I have good relationships with them, but I think I'm doing a better job now of, you know, having a little girl probably helped, but, um, of relating to my players and trying to really get to know them and invest in them. And, um, you know, at some ways though, that first two years was a little easier because I, when you are an assistant, you have that relationship with them. Yeah. So yeah. I had that innately and I didn't have to work at it enough early, you know? Mm-hmm. So I always say, I wish I would coach that team now. Cause I think I'm just a lot better at dealing with guys and dealing with the players and also I'm a better coach. I've been doing it longer, but um, yeah, those are, there's always regrets. And that's probably one of them is just, I coach those guys pretty hard. So we have two more questions here, coach. This has been great. Thank you for, for being here on the show. And I love asking this first question to coaches. I don't ask it to too many other people, but you're in a unique spot in pouring into others and always being the guy who your teammates, your assistant, I mean, your, your players, your assistant coaches are coming to you <clears throat> and saying, help me, show me, teach me, mold me. And yet, you empty your tank, somebody's got to fill up your tank, right? So who pours into you today? You mentioned getting in God's word every day. That's obviously, I think, number one for all of us as believers. But how do you stay fed in your faith? Um, I have some good friends. I don't have, unfortunately, they've moved away. So I don't stay as connected. You know, we still talk and we try and get together. Um, to be honest, that's one area where I think Chapel at Cedarville has helped. If I can get over there and we, we try and get there once a week as staff. Um, but um, that's probably something to be frank and be real with you. I got to do a better job of is staying connected to some of those guys that can pour into me. But I do have a few. Um, I, I don't. You probably are familiar now with Nations of Coaches. Of course. There's guys there. We don't have a chaplain necessarily through them because Cedarville is so, you know, I've got – I've got my choice of PhD <laughs> yeah. Bible guys across the lake that I can go. And we got a really good chaplain. He was an all American basketball player and he's tremendous with our guys. So he's a guy that invests in me some, I am fortunate. A lot of times at this level of college basketball, you have younger guys as your assistants. And I have had that. Um, so you, it's another place where you're emptying your tank. I'm fortunate. I have two guys in their sixties as my assistant coaches that, um, that really do a good job recharging me at times. So mm. <laughs> that's good. My wife is my best friend. Um, she's tremendous with that. Um, but to be real, I probably need to get somebody that I'm more consistently connected with. No, um, I think that's a struggle for all of us. You know, I mean, no matter what you're doing, but even if you're just a dad pouring yeah. into your kids all day and you remember, oh, I still need uh, that fatherly figure or your dad, if he's still around, to yeah. pour into you as well. So I think that's a struggle, coach or not. Um, yeah. My dad is that guy. That's I talk good. To him a lot. Yeah. So is that guy and nations of coaches let's just give him a plug because every time i bring him up tommy kyle uh shoots me a text and says thank you so we love those guys they're awesome and uh had been privileged to work with them both at the final four last year and even at their retreat in atlanta um last year as well great people and they do great work um patrick last question thanks for being here on the show again what are you you learning from god today so you mentioned about the last few years and God's been showing you, especially to get in his word, but we learn something new. It feels like every single day, uh, from the Lord, it's kind of that part of renewing, renewing our minds. So what is God teaching you today? Uh, recently it's, it has been to trust in him. And, and we say that a lot, but I think there, there, there will always be situations where I want to take control of what's going on. And, God has stepped in and provided like unbelievable opportunities for me over the last year. Our recruiting, you know, I I talk about like, yeah, we work hard at recruiting, but at the end of the day, our last three recruiting classes have been like, you know, it's almost like God saying here, just, just get out of the way and watch me work, you know? And, (laughs) and he's done that with a lot of opportunities. And I slipped, I got on the NABC board of directors and it's like, I didn't deserve that, but He, he's smiling down and providing that opportunity. And one really cool story. We, you know, it's small college, so nobody gets everything financially that you want um, for your budgets or whatever. Sure. And, and the, the coolest thing that happened this off season was we got those three exhibition games with Valparaiso, Ohio state and Dayton and the exact dollar amount. And it's actually almost like $500 more, but it's like, 
almost to a T, the dollar amount that we need in our budget to kind of break even is what we got from those three games. And it was just, you know, you get those stressors that uh, are at a small college level where you're, you're always trying to do stuff for your budget or do other things. Um, and just watching God smile down and do some things like that, where he's like, hey, I got it. Just let let me go. All right. And that's, uh, that's been the biggest part. Um, the biggest thing he's been teaching me is to let him fight my battles. I don't have to fight them myself. And I'm not the best at that. I'm still learning the hard way a lot of times. But um, that, that's really been evident over the last probably six months to a year. That's good stuff. He is Patrick Eastap, Cedarville University. Keep an eye on them this year. Division two NCAA and certainly the NCCAA as well, being the 2019 NCCAA national champions. We didn't really even talk about the exhibitions, you guys. By the yeah. time this podcast will air, uh, those exhibition games will be over, but you're facing Ohio State, Valpo, and Dayton. Let me get one quick more question in. Tell me how those come about and why they're so important to play those powerhouses to get you kind of ready for a season. Yeah, well, I got a couple, I got friends that coach in each program and they were generous to us. I've known Chris Holtman um, since he was an assistant at Taylor and he, he is salt of the earth. Like he's a really quality guy. Um, and, um, you know, another believer out of state school. So it's cool to have, um, uh, have him throw that bone to us. Cause that's a big deal in Ohio to get to play them. But Valpo, we have a couple kids from there. I know one of their assistants really well, and they gave us a game and then Dayton, I know a couple of their assistants. So, um, those guys are very generous and those are a big deal to our program. So we're really excited about them. I hope we haven't got beat by 30 in each one of them when this thing comes out, but, uh, <laughs> uh, we're, for us, it's tremendous. You know, obviously the financial piece is big. It helps us out in a, in a lot a lot of ways, but also there's a recruiting side. You're getting to play Ohio state, you're getting to play Dayton. Um, Valparaiso will be another good one for us. We've got a couple of kids, like I said, from there. So they're always a great opportunity for a guy, for your guys. I think they give you a, a chance to go have to play at maybe a different intensity level, even though there's a lot of really good basketball teams in division two, um, going against that caliber of athlete and size will be a challenge, but it'll be good for us. So we're really excited about it. We sold 2,500 tickets for the Ohio state game. Um, to our student body and our fans. So I'm hoping that they all show up to some of our home games. But. I love it. Well, yeah, if you can get them there, you got to get them <laughs> yeah. to the home games too now. Yeah. Come on, guys. Yeah. Patrick uh, Eastep, this has been great. Thanks so much for being here on the show. We'll be watching Cedarville throughout the year and I wish you nothing but the best. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate what you're doing. Many thanks to Patrick Eastep, the Cedarville University men's basketball coach, for joining us here on Sports Spectrum's podcast will be fun to watch them in 2019 heading into 2020 and see if they can get to the NCAA Division II National Championship. Sounds like they got a lot of their players back from last year, a team that won the 2019 NCCAA National Championship. And it will be fun to see if they can get to that NCAA Division II National Championship level, as Coach Estep has said, is his team's goal. So many thanks to him. Thanks to Cedarville University and all that they do, advancing the kingdom of God. And certainly many thanks to our sponsors, Compassion International, for sponsoring this podcast. $38 a month, tax deductible. You can release a child from poverty. Go check out the website. You'll see the difference that you can make all these children listed there just waiting to be released from poverty and a great opportunity for you to answer that call from God. $38 a month. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Compassion, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and pray about releasing a child from poverty today. Many thanks to Patrick Estep. Many thanks to you for listening. We love you guys. We really do appreciate when you click that play button on the app that you listen to this podcast on, whatever app that is, whether it's iHeart, Apple, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify. The Sports Spectrum Podcast is on every single platform that you could imagine podcasts are found on, and that's helped us uh, know that you're listening to this podcast because of the numbers that we've had. Man, we've reached over a million downloads on this podcast, and it doesn't happen without you. So thank you. We really do appreciate you. If this is the first time that you've listened to Sports Spectrum, thanks for coming along. Thanks for joining us here. Check out all of our content. Our website has great articles all day long on the intersection of sports and faith. You can choose this podcast and listen to that whenever you want. There's over 
400 episodes to listen to on Sports Spectrum. We go back a couple years now, so there's lots of great content there. And our magazine, which is a quarterly magazine, it's been around for 30 plus years, the magazine is still going strong and it's a great tool to hand to someone, a great resource, put in a library, maybe have it at a bookstore. If you're a high school or college, uh, maybe you have a church and you're looking for some periodicals to give to young kids or to give to some men uh, or to just to give to anyone really who loves sports, man, check out the Sports Spectrum magazine. You can subscribe for 18 bucks uh, for the year, 18 bucks for the year. I almost said for month, but it's actually for the entire year for $18, you get a subscription to the Sports Spectrum magazine. So check that out as well. Thanks for listening. We love you guys. See you next time with a brand new episode here on Sports Spectrum's podcast. Have a great rest of your day.